Okay, everybody. So this is the last of the chapter four series. This is the chapter four PowerPoint part three. It's only 19 slides. This is just going to take a few minutes. Okay. All right, so the third of the four primary tissue types, remember we've already done epithelial tissues and connective tissues. The third primary tissue type is muscle tissue. Now we're gonna learn a lot more detail about muscle tissue when we get to chapter 10. So this is just kind of an introduction, okay? Now what makes muscle muscle is that the cells and it work with each other and protein fibers and they are specialized to contract or to shorten themselves. And there are going to be three types of muscle tissue found inside of our bodies. Skeletal muscle is what you're thinking of when I say muscle. Like if you're going to flex your muscles, skeletal muscles are the ones that are responsible for moving our bodies. They are always voluntary. That means you have to have a conscious thought in order to move them. Cardiac muscle is only found in the heart. And smooth muscle is found in the walls of hollow contracting organs like the stomach and the intestines and the bladder. Skeletal muscle is made up of long, thin cells called muscle fibers. Now, again, it's only skeletal muscle, oops, sorry. And every muscle fiber is a muscle cell. So each cell in a muscle is the length of that whole muscle. And I want you to think about the muscle that runs down the front of your thigh. Every cell in that muscle is very long. It's the length of that entire area on your thigh. Now, cell, uh, skeletal muscle cells do not divide. And so they make new fibers inside by the division of myosatellite cells. And they are actually fusions of thousands of cells. Because they're so big, one nucleus would not be enough to control the activities of the cell. So they have hundreds of nuclei per cell and the nuclei are pushed to the outer edges of the cell. So we say that they're on the periphery. We also have a certain banding pattern inside of the fibers that we're going to talk about more in chapter 10, which makes this type of cell tissue look like it is striped. And so we say in anatomy, it is striated. So striated means striped. So skeletal muscle is multinucleated with nuclei on the periphery. It is striated and it is voluntary. Again, voluntary means that it will not just contract without you thinking about it. You have to choose to contract skeletal muscles. So this is what skeletal muscle looks like. So this is looking at a, a section of muscle on the forearm. This is a artist's rendition, and here's what you actually see in the microscope. So the nuclei are along the edges. They are long cylinder-shaped muscles like straws. They have lots of nuclei on the edges, and you can see this dark light, dark light, stripy, striated pattern. These are the striations. Okay, so that is skeletal muscle. Again, it moves your skeleton. The second kind of muscle is called cardiac muscle, and it is only found inside the heart. It's also a striated muscle, so it's going to be stripy. The cells are much smaller than our skeletal muscle cells, and these can branch. And then between the different skeletal, excuse me, cardiac muscle cells, we have those special gap junctions that we talked about in the last chapter called intercalated discs. Now, cardiac muscle only has one nucleus per cell, and it's not on the outside edges. It's right in the middle of the cell. The heart has a pacemaker, which means it is auto-rhythmic or auto-regulated. Its, its contraction patterns are controlled almost by itself. And you cannot make your heart beat. So we say it is an involuntary muscle. So cardiac muscle is branching, uninucleated with nucleus in the center, striated, involuntary muscle with intercalated discs. So here is what it looks like. So this is a section of the heart here. And if you look over here, these dark vertical lines are the intercalated discs. You will only see these in cardiac muscle, not the other two. You see a nucleus here, and it's inside the middle of this cardiac cell. You can also notice that they can branch. So this is one that branched here, and you can see it's actually right here. Um, they, they're not just long straws like we saw with the skeletal muscle. The third kind of muscle is called smooth muscle. And we say they are spindle shaped. Now spindle is a word we don't use so much anymore. It means it's narrow on the ends and thicker in the middle. Um, some people have, have described it as a rounded toothpick shape. 
Now these can divide and regenerate. They only have one nucleus per cell and it's in the middle. This muscle lines all of your hollow organs. So anything that needs to churn or squeeze or move is gonna be filled with smooth muscle. And this is the only muscle type that does not have the striped pattern. So it is non-striated. Also, you can't tell your stomach when to churn or your intestines when to squeeze. And so it is involuntary muscle. So the characteristics of smooth muscle are spindle shaped, one nucleus per cell, nucleus in the center, non-striated, and involuntary. And this is what smooth muscle looks like. So if you look right here, they are long cells with the nucleus in the centers. Now, the reason why we don't ask you to identify smooth muscle on the microscope on the first lab test is because it looks very much like dense regular connective tissue. The difference would be the nuclei are in the cells and not between collagen fibers. All right, the last of the four primary tissue types is called nervous tissue. And what nervous tissue does is it generates and conducts electrical impulses in order to control the activities or receive information from other parts of the body. Most of our nervous tissue is located in the brain and spinal cord, with some exceptions in the form of the peripheral nerves. Now, the two types of cells that make up nervous tissue are neurons and neuroglia. Now, neuron is a particular cell. Neuroglia is a group of six different kinds of cells. Right now, you don't have to learn the kinds of neuroglia. We will get to those in a later chapter. So right now, just divide it into neurons and neuroglia. A neuron kind of looks like an alien. It has a cell body that has all the normal cell parts, a nucleus, a nucleolus, ER, Golgi, a mitochondria. But then it has long things that stick off of the cell body. Now, by the way, another word for cell body is soma, S-O-M-A. We might see that in a minute. The things that stick off of the cell body or soma are either for receiving signals, and then they would be called dendrites, or they are for sending signals, and each neuron only has one of these, it would be called an axon. It can also be called a nerve fiber, but we're going to use the word axon. So, like I said, they do kind of look like aliens, don't they? This part here would be the soma or cell body. We can see the nucleus, the nucleolus, we see rough ER, smooth ER, and mitochondria in here. These shorter branched pieces sticking off the cell body are the dendrites. And remember, they are the receivers of electrical signals. And then this very long one that's going off is the axon or the sender of electrical signals. And at the very end, the axon often splits off into these little fingers that we call telodendria. And then each of these could touch a different cell and control it. We will definitely be learning more about neurons later in the course. Now, neuroglia are the cells that help the neurons do their job. So these are gonna be located in the brain and spinal cord and some out in the peripheral nervous system. And they're gonna do things like repair, clean up, that's phagocytosis, give nutrients, provide a framework to hold on the neurons. So we're gonna learn a lot more about these later. Right now, if you were to look at a neuron under the microscope, you would only see little dots that would represent the neuroglial cells. Now, all tissues may face injury at some point. And if they are injured, they're going to go through two stages. Inflammation, which is called the inflammatory response, and then regeneration if they are able to regenerate. Not all tissues are able to regenerate. So the inflammatory response can be triggered by trauma like a physical injury or by infection with a pathogen. A pathogen could be a bacteria, a fungus, a virus, all sorts of things. If a cell becomes damaged, that damaged cell will begin to release things that are SOS signals to the immune system. And that will activate nearby guard cells called mast cells. And mast cells can then communicate with the rest of the immune system and call for changes to be made in that part of the body to help it defend itself and begin to repair. So in inflammation, the first thing that happens is lysosomes will release enzymes that will destroy any damaged cells and, unfortunately, surrounding cells. 
So sometimes healthy cells get damaged in the process of inflammation. This kind of tissue destruction is known as necrosis, and it happens several hours after injury. Now, this is different from cell-programmed suicide death, apoptosis, which is always neat, and the lysosomes keep everything within the cell membrane until the end. This would be leaking lysosomes, and several innocent, non-injured cells will be brought down, will be killed. Necrotic tissues and cellular debris will add up together and become pus. And then if that becomes trapped in the wound area, that can become an abscess. Now, like I said, not every tissue is able to regenerate. So epithelial tissues, connective tissues, except cartilage, and smooth muscle only regenerate very, very well, very quickly. Things that do not regenerate well or at all would be skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, cartilage, nervous tissue. Damaged cardiac muscle gets replaced by fibrous tissue through a process called fibrosis. Actually, this is a principle you should learn now. Anytime your body tears, your body says, oops, that's a weak spot. I need to fill that spot in with my strongest protein fiber. And if you've been following along in this chapter, you should know right now, bing, 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 that strong fiber is collagen. Now, if there were already collagen fibers there, extra collagen will produce a scar. But what if you're replacing a different kind of tissue? So if your heart fails, it has a damaged spot, and your body replaces heart muscle with collagen, collagen is not muscle. It cannot contract. So your heart is going to get weaker. It's not going to be able to pump as efficiently. Okay, we're going to continue this concept all through the course that you actually don't want damaged tissue because your body will always reinforce it with collagen, which does not behave like the normal tissue it is replacing. Okay, so here's our little boy. He has a scraped knee and he has a double problem because he has both an injury and he's opened up his skin for infection. So we're going to have a double whammy here. So he's damaged the skin and he has exposure to pathogens and toxins. So our security guards, our mast cells, will start the inflammation process by secreting something called histamine. Histamine starts to dilate blood vessels and makes things very watery and leaky. It will also release heparin, which thins the blood and prevents clotting and prostaglandins. And the three of these will re re result in a process called inflammation. Things that you will see in inflammation. We increase blood flow to the area to deliver immune cells. So the increased blood flow increases pressure in the area and makes it red and hot. Increased vessel permeability means more stuff is able to escape the vessels into the tissue, which makes it swell. And the swelling from the increased blood and the increased permeability pushes on nearby nerves. Plus, if there was any damage to tissue, the chemicals released by the necrotic cells are going to stimulate pain receptors. So we have increased blood flow, increased per vessel permeability, and pain as part of the inflammation process. So you're going to see increased local temperature, increased oxygen and nutrient delivery, which is good because this is going to help us with the regeneration process. Increased phagocytosis. So we have these cells that are going to gobble up any damaged dead cells and dead bacteria and other debris. And then we have to get rid of the wastes and toxins that would be generated. Okay, so that's the end of chapter four. Stay tuned. I'll be posting up some videos soon for chapter five.